kind of remarkable that we were all asked as presenters to come here and talk about turning points. And if you were paying attention, you'll notice that almost every single one talked in some way about connection. Whether that was connecting through others, through disconnecting with technology, or connecting at the dinner table, or even connecting with our own bodies. So I'm going to continue with that discussion today and talk about connections between masculinity and social connectedness. Now, I've been doing this long enough to realize that talking about men's issues can be a challenge. Right? Oftentimes, when we talk about things that men do, uh, we have to be able to hold two competing truths in our head at the same time. So while it might be true that men are more often perpetrate acts of physical violence, it's also true that most boys and men are not physically violent. Right? In fact, most of us are trying to get through life as uh, good, decent human beings. But the problem is we tend to focus on the extremes. We miss what's going on in between. I came across this image the other day. I think it, uh, there's, no, there's no better one out there to talk about masking emotions. And this individual's name is Christian Hopkins. He just released a uh, conceptual photography project on Flickr that documents his struggles with depression and found this far more therapeutic than seeing any therapist. All right, so today I'm going to talk about how we socialize boys and men to mask their emotions. Now, 10 years ago when I made a career change to get into this field, I never would have predicted that I'd be up here talking about uh, men and masculinity, and that's what I'd be teaching. Right? And in fact, when I started my clinical work, there weren't a lot of men in my program, and I remember actively resisting being the man therapist right, that everybody referred their male clients to. But we're talking about turning points, so today I want to share historical, professional, and personal ones that have led me to this point. So I want to begin with a little-known historical turning point that happened about 800 years ago in 13th century Europe. Now, at that time, the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II of Germany right, was in power, and was known to be uncharacteristically scientifically minded for a pope during the Middle Ages. And he was curious about what the natural language of God would be. And so he wondered, if we didn't speak to infants, if they didn't hear adult language, what would just emerge naturally? And really, this is an empirical question. You can put this to a test. And back at that time, he thought, you know, being what he was, he thought it might be Hebrew as the first language, or it could be Latin or Greek. I suspect there were European kings elsewhere who might beg to differ. Right? But at that time in history, it was not uncommon for women to die during childbirth. And so these infants would be raised in these large orphanages by wet nurses. So he devised a simple experiment. He took about 20 infants, and these were the instructions. All they were to be was to have their basic needs met. Fed, clothed, diapers changed. Under no circumstances were the caregivers allowed to interact with them, talk with them, cuddle, play, do all the things that we would expect with infants. The experiment was a dismal failure. By accounts written by a monk at the time, all of them were dead within several weeks. Now, you and I might know this as failure to thrive in modern day. Right? We know the importance of connection, so much so that even neonatal intensive care units have changed their practices from 50 years ago. Right now, they encourage contact between the parent and these sensitive children because it reduces health complications, and, uh, decreases time spent in hospital, and improves development across the board. Right, so we learned from that story about the richness and importance of social connection. And after that, I have to show you this picture, right, so you feel good. Uh, you know, speaking about emotional attachment, these are twin, uh, pygmy marmosets who are born in twin pairs. And the metabolic challenge is so great uh, by the mother to feed them that the uh, males often have to kick in and do a substantial amount of caregiving. So much so that even non-related males will come in and they'll carry these babies around. Right, this is attachment at its finest. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And I want to make some arguments that you know, we socialize boys away from attachment. Now, back to the story of about the importance of connection in both physical and mental health. I'm willing to bet if I pulled the audience right now and asked you what the primary risk factors for cardiovascular disease were, I think in short order, we'd come up with the usual suspects. Right? Inactivity, hypertension, cholesterol, smoking. Right? If you're not familiar with relative risk, what this means is if you are somebody who smokes, you are two and a half times more likely to develop CV disease than somebody who doesn't smoke. Right? This is our conventional uh, understanding of health. Now, upwards of 30 years or so of epidemiological research has found another culprit. And this might surprise some of you. Social isolation. People who are socially isolated are three times or almost three times more likely to develop cardiovascular disease than somebody who is socially connected. Now, this is not an abstract idea. This is not me with a political or religious ideology. This is not new ageism. We have study after study after study that shows us very clear evidence on the role of social connectedness. Now, what does this have to do with men and boys and men? 
Right, some of you might hold the stereotype, and maybe some of you might uphold the stereotype, of men being less emotional than women, right, being stoic, or that favorite phrase, boys don't cry. But I'm here to suggest otherwise. Uh, and actually, research suggests infant boys are actually more expressive in both range and intensity than infant females. And interestingly, if you watch a group of two or three-year-olds at play, both boys and girls, you see this wide range of negative and positive emotions. Right? And it's actually kind of hard to distinguish between the two because they're so similar. But the stories start to, to change over time. Right around age six when they get into kindergarten, these paths start to diverge. Now, if we fast forward into adolescence and young adulthood, we start to see a new pattern. Now, this is uh, one of my favorite photos. A colleague of mine at Clark University by the name of Michael Addis, his father took this on a street corner in Oklahoma back in the 50s. And I think you and I can all imagine what this guy's feeling. Right? And there's probably some pretty good rules about what he's allowed to show and what he's not allowed to show. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, there was a recent study, actually a series of them, that looked at, and they asked men and women in America, and it was kind of equal representation of European American, African American, Asian American. They uh, wanted them to generate a list and then rate emotions that are culturally acceptable for men and women here in the United States. And at the end of that, the results suggested that men were allowed to display these three emotions at greater rates, anger, contempt, and pride. Whereas women were allowed to experience joy, compassion, sympathy, fear, and a host of other ones. Now, we're talking about emotional expression at this point. Right? But that doesn't tell the whole story. If we hook these same individuals up to equipment that can measure our autonomic nervous system responses, and these are the things that we once thought we couldn't control, like heart rate, you know, skin conductance, sweat, muscle tension, breath rate, and then we expose them to stimuli that can evoke or elicit strong emotions, these gender differences disappear. So we're not so different on the inside, but it's very clear that we have some differences expected on the outside. What happened? Or what's happening to boys and men? Back in 1987, somebody by the name of Long came up with this male emotional funnel system. So we all come into the world with a full range of vulnerable emotions. You can see some of them there behind me. Fear, shame, but over time, we teach our boys to rechannel them into anger and aggression. And it's not that we like these displays, but we tolerate them and sometimes even accept them in our men. But what you don't know and you don't see is that half second before anger came, and I'm going to make the argument this is the true primary emotion. Right? If we feel shame, anger rises up to defend against it. Right? So I'm really interested in what's happening in that moment right before. Now this is Christian Hopkins again with this remarkable photo. Right, we teach boys that it's not okay to be vulnerable, it's not okay to be hurt, right, but it's okay to cover that up with either anger or silence. The problem with that is if we take that over the lifespan, the more we do that, the less connected we are with our own emotional states, and we can actually lose our ability to detect those subtle changes in our emotions. And if we extend it one more layer, we also then over time lose or impair our ability to detect those and respond to those and others as well. So now we've really created a problem when uh, two people are supposed to be interacting. Now it's not all about, well actually one thing I want to ask you is I want you to think about the person in your life, non-family member, who's closest to you. How do they go from being a complete stranger to being somebody whom you trust? Right, chances are, over time, there's that reciprocal vulnerability. Right, you, finally, you found somebody for whom you could be yourself and you didn't have to worry about that judgment. But it's not all about negative emotions. It turns out those same people who stilt those negative emotions report less compassion, joy, and all these other things, these positive things that we take for granted right, as part of the human experience. And as psychologists, we call that making a pact with the devil. Right? You can't get one without the other. Now, what's remarkable about being a human being is we have this giant forebrain, and we can make these decisions. We can say, you know what? You know, I just broke up with this individual. Right? I'm never going to get hurt again. I'm never going to be vulnerable. I'm never going to show weakness. But when we do so, we end up muting our experiences on both ends, and then that makes it harder to connect with people. My next turning point is a professional one. So I had a male client in his late 30s, came to his first session just angry, aggressive, a history of violence. I didn't want to work with him I, from right, right off the bat. I knew that. But a couple sessions in, I found out he had just an incredibly tragic trauma history. He himself had been a victim of severe physical abuse. He had perpetrated physical abuse. 
He had poly substance addiction, had declared bankruptcy, several failed relationships. But all he ever showed was anger. There was no hurt, right? there was no sadness, just anger every time. And a couple sessions in, he said to me, you know what? I know what you're trying to get me to do, and I'm not going to do it. I haven't cried in 25 years, and I'm not going to start now. And I said, look, to be honest with you, I don't care whether you cry or not. Right? But my goal is to help you get in touch with what you're experiencing. And if that involves crying, then so be it. But I said, I was really curious. I said, so what, what do you find so aversive about the idea of crying? And he looked at me straight in the eye, dead serious, and said, I'm afraid that if I start, I'm going to crawl up in a fetal position and never be able to stop. So, th so that told me he was well aware of what he was masking and controlling in that situation. Now you can probably suspect where the story's going to go, right? Eight, about eight weeks after that, came in, we're having a session, and all of a sudden the tides changed, and here he was, and he just wept. Wept openly for the first time in 25 years in front of a man no less. Right? There was no anger. There was no shame. It was just calmness and stillness. And I was actually very emotionally moved as well. And at the end of it, he kind of, you know, once it was kind of all over, he looked really relaxed and he looked up to me and he kind of smiled and he goes, huh, now I see why people do that. Right? <laughs> but I had a little turning point then. I said, you know what, if being the man therapist means that I can be part of this journey with these individuals, then, you know, sign me up. This is something I want to do professionally. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to challenge these norms. I study this stuff, I teach it, I research it, I encourage my male clients to do it, right? But I stumble with it all the time. And so my next story is a personal one. So a couple years ago, a colleague had sent me a link to a, a photo project called Days With My Father on dayswithmyfather.com. Philip Teledano is a UK-based uh, photojournalist, and he chronicled his father's uh, struggle with Alzheimer's disease. So I'm here at my kitchen table, tears streaming down my face. I was alone, so it was okay. And uh, I heard my uh, daughter you know, say, Papa, you know, time for tub time. And so my gut reaction was to shut this thing down, right? wipe my eyes, and then I started rationalizing. It's like, oh, you know what, she's never seen me cry. It's going to confuse her. It might freak her out. I don't know how to explain this. Uh, you know, so I went on. We had our normal evening. Later that night, I was lying in bed and saying, oh, my gosh. You know, I just missed this opportunity. You know, it could have been a teachable moment to say, hey, daddy's cry too. Uh, and she could get that. I mean, she would understand. You know, she cries when the lights were too bright in the morning when I wake her up. Right? But I had kind of put myself in check, and I missed that. And so I want to ask you all, you know, how many opportunities have we missed with men in our lives to, to be vulnerable and be honest there? But I find a fascinating irony in this men's issue stuff, because men are also uh, tend to score higher on risk-taking behaviors than women. Right? Strap myself to a kite and a surfboard, sign me up. Right? Do whatever these guys are doing in a swimming pool. You know, yes, please. But going out with your best friend, putting your arm on his shoulder, maybe even looking him in the eye, and saying, you know what, you mean a lot to me. I'm really glad you're in my life. This is when they're supposed to cue crickets chirping. Right? We don't do those things. And by the way, it doesn't count the I love you man six beers in to bar time. Right? That's not what I'm talking about here. It's very different than that. All right, which brings me to this turning point for you all. Right? Social change doesn't require this massive organized movement. I mean, all it requires is each one of us to make one, one small change in our lives right? to, to get people to respond in a different way, right? to put down this mask. But it's a misconception that I'm out here spreading a message that men have to stop, be, you know, stop being men. I'm not asking men to radically change who they are. When I work with men on this issue, I, I really say, hey, this is another skill that you can learn and that you can apply in the right situations. And I'm not saying that uh, we have to do this in all situations. You and I know very well that there are places that we find ourselves where that emotional control and restriction is called for and it's necessary. My concern is that when we take that, and that is our default mode in our human relationships. So we come into our workplace, we come into our family, we come into our friendships with just that blocking and that masking. But changing this doesn't have to be complicated. And I came up with two simple tips for us just to even start with. One is, let's eliminate phrases like man up, boys will be boys, stop acting like a girl. Right? Just acknowledge that these are common human emotions we all experience, and they don't have to be gendered in any way. The second point 
is let's redefine what it means to be courageous. And if you think about it, it doesn't require courage to hide behind a mask. Right? What requires courage is to be open and vulnerable no matter what the outcome. And that's really what we're asking and what I ask men to do. So I want to end with an observation I made a year ago. I was uh, taking my two kids trick-or-treating. And a group of four boys, we're probably about 11 or 12, were engaged in what I call competitive trick-or-treating. Right? So they're just like darting from house to house trying to fill up these bags. And they whiz by us on the driveway. And this one guy you know, yells to his friend. He says, you better tie your shoe. They get up to the house. They get their candy. They bound off the porch. Sure enough, the kid with the untied shoe takes a digger onto the concrete. And my first reaction was, here it comes. Right? This guy's going to get it. But that's not what happened. So his friend gets on one knee, puts his hand on his shoulder, and says, man, are you OK? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. He's like, see, that's what I told you. That's why I wanted you to tie your shoe. I didn't want to see you get hurt. Are you sure you're OK? And the friend's like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. So because if you're not OK, I'm sure all of us will be just fine going back to my house. We can stop trick-or-treating. We can just hang out. And his friends are nodding their head. He's like, you sure you're okay? And he's like, yeah, no, that's fine. We can keep being out here. He's like, well, at least let me tie your shoe. And he gets down on his other knee and ties his friend's shoe, and then they go off sprinting to the next house. But I learned a lesson that night because I had my own expectations, and they were proven wrong. And I'm willing to bet if we turn off the nightly news and sometimes our news feeds and our social media sites and just look around us, you're going to see a lot more of that happening than we know. And by recognizing it and seeing it, then we start to make small cultural shifts where people learn that it's OK and it's not going to be judged negatively uh, or punished. So back to this image. My wish for you as an audience is to walk away from this and commit to removing the mask, at least in some small way. Now, I've been met with criticism with this message. Right? And it's usually in the form of, but aren't we going to wussify or sissify our American boys and men? But I want to remind you of the male emotional funnel system. So if you hear this message and you feel this like defensive anger pop up, what was it that you experienced right before that? Right? And what truly do we have to fear by doing this? So when you go back out into your lives, I want you to be courageous, be vulnerable, and just take one small risk with somebody in your life to make a deeper connection. Thank you for your time.